Matthew Motola, you are the co-founder and CEO of Venture L, the leading platform for freelancers to run their business. And you are the co-author of The Human Cloud, how today's change makers use artificial intelligence and the freelance economy to transform work. Matthew, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Alan. Pumped to talk with you all. So, yeah, Matthew, this is a uh, um, very timely um, conversation, mostly because the whole, uh, the whole area of work is being changed in, right in front of our eyes. Uh, one day a person has a job, a regular job, I don't know, in a brick and mortar uh, business, and then the next day they have to do their work from their computer. And in addition to that, I had, I think, about three podcast guests that they are saying that work as we know it is being eliminated, that machines are going to take over. And uh, you are in this field, so I'm just so eager to ask you a whole bunch of questions about it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I know. I, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the, the automation debate of will we even have jobs. So let's bring it on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. I always been a doubter on that script, but but let's bring it on. First of all, can you tell us a little bit about your background? How your origin story? How do you get started into this field? Yeah, for sure. And I think uh, I'll try to tie it to what you talked about in the beginning, where you know, looking at COVID, what's been the impact? And for me, the stuff that we're shifting into has actually always been normal. And so my background is everything freelance. Uh, it's it's funny. Usually, there's two areas you go. You become the best at a skill. Or a specific domain. So for me, I started freelancing in college. It was the first thing I did. I didn't know it was called freelancing. Actually, I, I did it uh, because I needed to pay for to pay for myself, and I couldn't do a full time job. So I would go to local businesses and I would say, "How can I help?" They would say, "You tell me." I'd say, "Well, I'm a business manager. I can f figure out some of your competitors. I can do some of your books. You name it." And I worked like that throughout college, uh, and then I sort of was the traditional route. And, and if anyone out there is going down sort of the finance and accounting route. That was me. Like I, I, I aced the sort of major, got the good job, but I couldn't believe that that's the way we had been organizing it. And so I had this sort of, you'd call it a coming to Jesus moment or whatever, whatever you want. But for me, I knew freelancing and everyone said that it was, it was this immature way of working that I'd grow up one day. And then I hit real work and I went, oh my God, there's no way we're going to actually be working like this in 10 years. And I'll tell you what, I didn't expect COVID to accelerate uh, what was already happening. So that's sort of how I, I started was I had a really, really, I'd say, called existential or whatever you want. I had a really, really important moment where I realized freelancing just was the type of work that I wanted to do. Uh, so then from there, I, I, I do it first. Uh, I sort of scaled my own freelance business. I built a freelance platform. I then jumped into a company called Gigster, which we were doing million dollar software projects, 100% through freelancers, uh, then went to Microsoft and sort of led their product where we were enabling large companies to spend on freelancers just like they were doing with agencies. So this is enabling them to go from say zero to up to $100 million. And then most recently with Venturel. So my, my whole life has been the freelance economy and specifically how do we scale it? Meaning for individual freelancers, how do we get you more money? And then from a client side, how do we get clients to grow by hiring and managing freelancers? And when you said you started as a freelancer, what in, what specifically were you doing? Yeah, you, you could call it management consulting. I'd say it would be the highest description. Uh, but usually what would happen is I'd go in and, and I, a competitive analysis. So if you're, if you're a freelancer out there and you're thinking about how do I get the first project, think about the smallest chunk of output or outcomes you can deliver. And so for me, it was I'll get you 15 competitors and I'll give you two to three insights on opportunities for your business within two weeks for $2,000. And then from there, it would usually turn into, wow, we didn't think about that. Can you then create a business plan? So I'd go create a business plan. And one of the projects that I um, you know am over, people always ask like, what's your, your proudest moment, right? And for me, one of the, the projects we worked on was we actually saved 75 manufacturing jobs because we picked apart this insight that uh, this thing called resourcing, basically jobs were coming back from China, but only if you had the specific manufacturing structure. So I was sort of the one behind the scenes doing a lot of the research, crafting the business models for that to happen. Wow. And you work um, for Microsoft. Many college students will kill for a job in Microsoft and they will bribe and prostitute themselves or do whatever they have to do in order to get there. And you, you left it or how, what happened there? 
Yeah, I, I think so. When we look at myself at Microsoft, it's a testament to the ability of freelancing to accelerate your career. And so what we do in the book is we, we don't just say, hey, everyone's going to be freelancers. I fervently don't believe that. But I leave, believe that there's three ways that every individual is impacted by the freelance economy. And that is you can be a freelancer, you can hire freelancers, or you can build organizations around freelancers. So that first rung of being a freelancer, because I chose freelancing over traditional internships, or actually in addition to, I had accelerated feedback loops, meaning when you would go do a traditional internship, it'd be like three months, right? And everyone has the same bullet point of what they did. In freelancing, you have tangible outcomes. So the, but by the time I came out of college, I had management experience. I had over 10 projects that I could point to saying, this is what I've done. So, you know, to be honest, there's no way in hell that I would have been able to get into Microsoft out of college, but because of the freelancing that I had done when Microsoft actually came calling, instead of a, hey, let's go through this very long interview process where you need to show up and outcompete a thousand people, it was more symbiotic. It was more, hey, we're looking to create a product. We realize that you've done this numerous times. You have numerous comparables, numerous examples numerous reviews from people just like us saying that they would hire you. And so you tell us what you want to do. And so I sort of showed up having control uh, over my own terms. And so that was, you know, how I got in. I think that the, the takeaway for everyone listening is that when you're freelancing, what it does is it does accelerate your career path. When one quote is uh, you can, it, it's kind of like dog years, right? Like my, my, my dog years are my, my gig years. Right. So, so that's sort of what got me in there. Uh, and in terms of, you know, what happened, uh, or what I did at Microsoft, also a testament to freelancing. Because one thing we bring up in the book is that companies, specifically employees, are going to look like freelancers in terms of we all are going to work with digital tools in a remote fashion, not just remote, but in a remote fashion. And we're going to have to produce outcomes. So the days of here's my paper resume, I'm going to go work at a company for two years, just shuffle paper back and forth, and then jump to another one, that is, that is not over today, but it is inc rapidly, increasingly over. And so when I went to Microsoft, I did exactly what I did as a freelancer. I said, what do we want to accomplish? What are our goals? And what is our time frame? So the goals there was create an enterprise or a customer product that has at least 10 customers by May 1st. And if I don't hit it, fire me. <laughs> like that was literally the, and I think it was like, um, you know, May 1st and in a year, this is what we're going to do. And so that became actually the Microsoft 365 freelance toolkit where I did exactly what I would do in companies. You know, you go in, you identify a problem, you start to draft up solutions, you ideate, you incubate, you bring it to market, you scale it. And so that's what we did at Microsoft. And, and sort of the, the reason to leave is instead of, you know, when a corporate employee, you feel like it's you and just one employer, you kind of get used to the abundance mindset where you realize it's about the challenge and it's about what you want to learn and what you want to accomplish, not necessarily just having to work for one company. Right. Um, so a lot of people are paying up to $200,000 for a college education, for a piece of paper. And there are tools that allow you to learn all these freelancing skills for free in the internet. So I wonder what's, First of all, what's the disconnect? What are the freelancers seeing that all these um, people are not seeing that they just want to pay? They just want to pay this two hundred k for this piece of paper when they can get that education for free. And then, secondly, what do you think is the future of education? Where do you think this is going? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so to summarize, it's it's why go pay two hundred k for a piece of paper, right? right. I, I think there's. I want to clarify by saying I, I don't, similar to the, I don't believe the world should be all freelancers. I don't believe that we should get rid of school or you shouldn't go to school. Uh, I think that freelancing is a accelerator. And what I mean by that is we call it the amplification effect. If you're valuable in full-time work, you're going to be more valuable in freelancing. You're going to make more money and you're going to have more control. If you're not valuable in full-time employment, then you're going to have a worse time off and you're going to be stuck on gig marketplaces, whether it's Uber driving, DoorDash, you name it. So I want to make sure at a, at a high level at the top, we are not saying in any way, shape, or form that freelancing is going to replace and be the sort of seeker carrot. Now, with that said, I think the way you look at school uh, is similar to the way you look at freelancing. And what I mean by that is that you have to be very, very intentional in terms of what you want. And in the book, you know, we do have a very, very clear roadmap in terms of a five-step process of, of how to start freelancing. But I think the important thing for the context behind this, when I look at school, I think at school is time to experiment and a network. And that's one thing freelancing actually can't give you because freelancing, you do need to make money. 
Whereas when you're in school, you have one, two to four years of time to just totally F up and try a bunch of different things. That's beautiful. And I hope we don't lose that. And so me, you know, me personally, I, I went to a grad school called, I, so I, I did undergrad and I did grad school. In undergrad, I knew I couldn't pay for four years of a really good school or a really expensive school. So I basically did my finance and accounting there. And then grad school was very intentional, sort of entrepreneurship focused. I wouldn't trade the world for my grad school. I owe everything to Babson College. Like that was one of the best times. But in terms of why is it gave me time and network. And network is also something that I don't want to give answers of sort of, you know, I, do I believe we can replicate a network in the next five years? For sure. Meaning in a, in, a, in a remote environment. Is that true today? Absolutely not. There are still clear advantages to be somewhere, obviously in the post COVID world, um, but there's still clear advantages. So to your first question of, of you know, university, and if, if someone's thinking out there, my kid's about to drop out, hell no. I actually think that's a horrendous idea just as, as a blanket answer. Uh, obviously it's con contextual dependent. Um, but yeah, and in terms of your, your second question of where education should go. So like I said, I, I fervently believe in institutions. Uh, I think that it's gonna be institutions that get us through uh, the needed change that we have to have as a society. And so one thing I do is I do guest lecture at Georgia Tech. And I made sure that we uh, sort of broke down their entrepreneurship curriculum with the focus of getting these students ready for the workforce that they will walk into. And so the way that I sort of see education and now caveat that I'm not an educational expert. I'm not a professor. I've never been a dean. So I'm not talking with operational excellence in terms of a university, uh, you know, how to run a university. But I think that what has to sort of happen is just like the workplace. It has to be digital, it has to be remote, and it has to be outcome driven. That's the sort of things that I would say to universities. Wow. Okay, so you are on your own and you just published this book, The Human Cloud. First of all, how did that came about and what is the book about? Yeah, I, I wish you could say it just came, out, came about overnight. Uh, fun fact is actually it was released or we handed over the manuscript on January 25th of last year and it was written. Yeah, so, so anyone that's thinking, wow, that was timely. Like you really, really, really put this out in the perfect timing. We, we, we didn't. We actually finished it last January, uh, but very intentionally wrote it in a way that it can be applicable in 10 to 50 years. So, so that was that. Was that. Uh, in terms of how the book came about, I mean, I've, I've been doing this my whole life. And so throughout this, whether it was, you know, leadership meetings, whether it was trying to get money from investors, whether it was articles, you name it, I've been writing about this for my whole life. And so it was the consolidation. Um, one thing that we did that we're very intentional about is you'll see no stats. Like a lot of books you read in business, right? There's mil like mostly, especially the, the Harvard business ones, right? Like there's millions of stats and everything's very conceptual and theoretical. And we kind of said F that. And one very important thing we did in the beginning of the book is we said, you're only going to get 20% of the knowledge. Meaning as product people, we make our money off of what we ignore, not how much we know. And so instead of a, you know, theoretical, here's a bunch of statistics, we just gave you our experience. That was it. We walked you through our world. So in, in terms of what the book's about, at a high level, you know, the, the main thesis is that never before have we been able to do so much with so little. Meaning if you're a freelancer, if you're hiring freelancers, you're a company. And the reason that we can do so much with so little is because of three technologies, remote work, the freelance economy, and automation. And so the book is exploring that. We sort of introduce you to the people, we give you the technical insights, and then we give you tools that you can use or action steps that you can use the second you read it to take action on it. And, and I can't stress enough, it, it really is about doing so much with so little. It's, it's not about, you know, here's freelancing, go blog on a beach in Bali. Everyone has different situations. Maybe you want to have a family, maybe you want to live in, you know, an area that's not a big city. Um, so yeah, so that's it. Doing so much or so little, thanks to remote work, the freelance economy, and artificial intelligence slash automation. Well, wow. okay. Imagine for a second that before COVID, I used to be a waiter in a restaurant right across the street, and I have my regular hours and my good uh, paycheck or tips money. Now I lost my job, and I hear all this about freelancing and how I can make my, pay my bills to my computer. If I'm a clean slate, if I just want to get started and I just want to make sure I can pay my rent and my food, what would be some uh, ways to get started or where should I venture to, assuming I know nothing about this world of free, uh, freelancing? Yeah, so what I'm gonna tell you to do is I'm gonna tell you to go talk to 15 people 
that you are interested in potentially working for or working with. So that's gonna be the action item. And let me tell you why. The reason for that is what I'm gonna tell you, what I'm gonna tell you first is the currency of the freelance economy and then how to unlock that currency. So the currency of the freelance economy is outcomes. That's all it runs by. It doesn't care where you went to school, it doesn't care what you did, it doesn't care what you look like, it doesn't care how old you are. It literally just cares about what can you do, what is an example, what is the tangible KPI, how much, and how long. That's it. So now in order to unlock that, because I love this situation of you're a waiter, the first question is gonna be, what the hell do you wanna do? Meaning, what are you curious about? Do you wanna be a waiter? If yes, let's think about what it is about being a waiter that you're actually curious about so that we can start building outcomes that you can bill for. So maybe it's because you're interested in restaurants. Well, what can you do within restaurants that have a scoped outcome? Maybe you go to a business and you help them create their infrastructure when it comes to having a waiting staff. Maybe you help with their point of sale system. I'm not an expert in, in restaurants. So what I'm giving you, you're, you know, you're the expert out there on that. So. That's the first thing that we have to do is we really, really, really have to just figure out what in the world do you want to do from a curiosity perspective? And then the second thing, which sort of is why I gave you first is let's go out and meet those people. And specifically, you're going to meet people that you will potentially collaborate with and people that will hire you. One of the biggest misnomer in sales and getting jobs is we've been trained to put our resume in an HR system. And we keep doing that, even though everyone knows informally that jobs come from relationships generally. The freelance economy is no different. So if you go and you send out, say, 500 emails, yeah, maybe one person will say, hmm, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll pay you for something. But what we've seen, at least based off our data, and I think we sort of all intuitively know this, is that if you go meet with people who either A, you'll collaborate with, meaning they need more hands to help with their existing client, or clients, that is where sort of the best, the best driver is generally from relationships. So how's that? If, if is, you know... Are you a waiter now that's ready to, to, to take control of this? <laughs> that's a good starting point. Uh, I see the problem that, um, you know, since the, since the industrial revolution, we have been addicted to that monthly or biweekly paycheck. I mean, that has been the structure of our whole economy. And, and even our parents have been telling us, oh, get a good job or stay a, a government job or a union job. That's, and then the idea of having to stand on your own and it's you, you get paid by your marriage, by your products, not by your CV. I think that's the major uh, barrier for many people to go into freelancing. I'm going to be on my own. No one is going to guarantee me a check at the end of the week. I have to somehow get that check, uh, get that client and produce something that it will be of value to the market. I think that's the major sticking point. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that the two things, if you're thinking that, and there's, there's no getting over that, right? You're going to have to take ownership and take control. And here's the deal. You still might have a monthly paycheck, by the way. There's the, freelancing is not immune to that. The difference is it runs off a contract versus a W-2 salary. But so the two things, if, if that's what you're thinking about right now, you know, listen, I feel you, I hear you. We've, we've all had that sort of that gut reaction. Even when I left Microsoft and I had been doing it for so long, I was like, oh yeah, I kind of missed this paycheck, <laughs> right? Like it's kind of nice. But um, the, the two things that you have to do is I, that's exactly why I want you to go out and meet other freelancers because not only can that be a driver, it is the leading driver for work, but also it'll open you, it'll, it'll help you have a softer landing into these specific kind of things. So that'd be the first thing is, is go meet other freelancers or other people that are doing contract work. Second thing is there are platforms. Now there's good and there's bad of freelance platforms. And specifically there's Upwork, there's Freelancer. I would say anyone can go to Upwork. Uh, that's more of a generalist. There's also niche ones. So if you're a waiter, I'd go to Google and I would search waiting freelance platform or hospitality freelance platform. There's millions of freelance platforms out there. What a freelance platform does is it handles all of the admin crap that you don't want to do in the beginning of your journey. And so payments going to happen through the platform. Clients are going to happen through the platform. You're still probably going to have to bid for work, but a lot of this sort of uh, stuff that you thought you're going to have to do on your own, the platforms will do. So that's the first thing is, like I said, go meet 15 freelancers uh, to get specific 
meet five that do exactly what you do and then do 10 that you think have complementary skill sets where you can be in addition to them. And then second thing is look at freelance platforms, specifically look at your skill. So if you're marketing, look at We Are Rosie. If you're in finance and accounting, look at Paro. If you're a student, there's a great one called Parker Dewey. And it also can be regional. So if you're in I think it's Malaysia, you can look at Work Anna. If you're in Singapore, you can look at Creatives at Work. So it is very, very customized. Wow, that's a lot of information. Uh, at the beginning of the podcast, I told you I had a few guests, I think three, and some of them with high government position saying that this is the end of work, that uh, the uh, uh, AI is going to take over and it's only going to be big companies like Google who are going to be able to earn money and everybody else is going to have to be dependent of this universal income. And I definitely don't agree with it. I think as technology improves, there is going to be even more wealth, uh, job creation, not, not job uh, 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 elimination. Uh, so I wonder where do you stand on that? Yeah, I'm with you. I say hell no. I mean, if, if automation was going to take over all our jobs, then why did we stop at having more than one suit or one piece of clothing? Right? Like seriously, like back, what was it? 200 years ago, we could have avoided all this crap of, you know, all the extra things we don't need in society. And so I, I yeah, that's, that's my answer. And, and listen, I, I'm not a AI expert. I, I'm, I'm not even a computer science expert. I have taken a lot of intro to, you know, computer science course at Harvard and blah, blah, all that stuff that you can do for free. Um, but no, that's my, that's sort of my approach. The three things that I'd say though, that are hypercritical in terms of what's shifting is number one is driven off relationships. So in a freelance and remote environment, which I know can sound counterintuitive, right? They're like, oh, it's freelancing and you're working on contracts. Shouldn't that be transactional? No, it actually makes the relationship much more important. So that's the first shift is that relationships become ever more important, which actually fun fact in the book, what we say in the first chapter is uh, the number one thing you should do in order to get ready for this world is have a fun fact on hand because never before you're going to have to be saying your fun facts. Uh, it's, it's not once every two years when you change your job or every 10 years. Now it's going to be like once every couple months. Wow. But so relationships are the first thing. Second thing is going to be ownership. So that's one of the huge differences is that the freelance economy doesn't care that that wasn't in your job responsibility or doesn't care that you hadn't been given a checklist. All it cares about is what are the outcomes that you're going to produce. So it's all about ownership. You can't throw shit over the fence and blame it on somebody else. You are what you produce. You are your outcome. So you have to own it. Uh, you have to own it. And then the third thing is augmentation. So before we've lived in a world where it was, we were specialists. And this is where some of the, you asked the education question. This is where education can get very, very tricky is that you, you know, we've grown up thinking we had to master absolutely everything within, uh, within whichever domain we were told yet with with a lot of these technologies that's not the case and so if you think about the if we look at our phone right now this thing could br brought us to the moon uh, mm -hmm. uh what was it 50 60 years ago like it's insanity the amount of power that we have in our hands if you were a man 1500s or alexander the great and you realize the potential you now had just by having a smartphone holy crap so that's the third thing is there's no excuse to not be able to produce outsized outcomes which I'm not here to debate which is good and bad. I'm here to debate sort of what the technology is doing. And so the, the third thing, so first thing is relationships. Second thing is you have to take ownership. Third thing is you do have to realize that there is augmentation and we are going to have to be what we call it. We call them, you know, change makers. Uh, and we do actually bring up the Vitruvian ideal. We have a cute picture in the back of the book. But um, that's the third thing is that it's all about sort of augmentation and being able to do more by leveraging the freelance economy and automation. Wow. Okay. So you are also the CEO of Venture L. Can you tell us exactly what is it, what does it do, and what do you do as a CEO of that of Venture L? Yeah. So Venture L, uh, we're an operating system to scale a freelance business. Think about for just the freelancers. So we're not a dual side of marketplace. We don't match make clients and freelancers. Freelancers that work on Venture L end up being better, meaning they make more money, they spend less time in operations because of the software that we can give them. So in terms of why, right? Because I think that's what's most important. The book says, this is the technology. This is the future. This is how we should set the standard. Venture L then says, here's the software to actually make that happen. Because if we don't have Venture L, what I wake up and lose sleep over 
is that technology is value neutral and the gig economy, I would argue is exploitative and it is a race to the bottom. It literally just says a client posts a job and then whoever wins the bid wins, no different than eBay. And so what VentureL does is it says, instead of having a marketplace driven future of work, we have a relationship driven future of work because instead of needing a marketplace, freelancers can team up, create their own collectives, collaborate on work together, refer work back and forth. So I would argue we're taking the good of what companies had, meaning it's one place that we can all meet up and get work done without the bad, which is the corporate craft, needing to have the office, needing to be inefficient. Um, so yeah, so that's venture out at the end of the day, an operating system that enables freelancers to do more by forming collectives and being, being better at their, at their business. Well, I do agree with you that um, it is all about relationships. So let's say I design websites and one I, once I have created, I don't know, five or 10 beautiful websites, people are going to come to me and offer me whatever, whatever um, they are capable of paying. Uh, but uh, aren't beginners supposed to start by charging? Let's say now I am a beginner website developer. I'm on my first or second website. Don't they get into the market by offering low prices? So, the, so the, at a high level, when you start, is it acceptable to take lower work or uh, how in the world do you have a, what we could call higher acceptable rate when you don't have the experience? Is right. that a good way to frame it? Or, or, or re reviews or whatever. Someone yeah. has to take the risk of hiring me when there's no reviews. And usually people do that by offering a lower price. Yeah. So, so, the, so I refuse to, to sort of, I'd say comment on the free work debate. I personally don't believe it. And I refuse to ever pay someone for doing free work. I believe that instead it's all about scoping out the smallest possible outcome and building off of that. Uh, but with that said, I, I, I see goods and bads of, of both sides. So I want to make sure I do make it clear. You know, I don't take a stance on doing free work. I don't recommend it, but I also don't not recommend it because I've seen it work in certain scenarios. Um, with that said, one of the scary parts of the freelance economy is that we're gutting out all of the corporate structure pretty much. And so the good thing about an org chart is that there was a predictability in terms of a ladder. And so you knew that after a year, you could become a senior associate after two years, you were a manager and so and so. The freelance economy doesn't not have that. It just isn't defined. And so the freelance economy, like we mentioned, runs by outcomes. So if you've done say five outcomes or you've done 10 or 15, you can charge a higher rate than back when you only had nothing or one. Right. Now, how do we get from zero to 15? This is the tough part. Yeah. What I would argue is that number one, exhaust your existing relationships. Mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised with most freelancers that that can do it, right? And, and exhaust meaning take more of a relationship, not just, hey, like, number one thing not to do, don't go on, and usually mark list, don't go compete at cost. If you're going to compete at cost, you're going to lose. And you might win the project, but you're going to lose the long-term game. So don't give in to thinking that you have to outbid to the lowest price. Instead, focus on what relationships you can build that are long-term. Now, I know that's theoretical. So now, in terms of what that means from a tangible next step, form relationships with fellow freelancers just like you joined a company. Because if you take 10 freelancers, two have way too much work and are dying to be able to offload some of that work. And the work isn't just stuff that they could do but it's stuff that might be below with a pay grade, meaning stuff that's perfect for you. So that's what we've seen is the best. And, and for, you know, I, how do I say this? I was fortunate that when I started freelancing, I just needed $2,000 a month. So I'm not going to, you know, act like I can relate to every single person's situation of needing maybe four or six or $8,000. So I did what was best in my, my situation. But what we've seen from the data, is just like how you would join a company and you would climb up the ranks, there's a similar relationship when you join fellow freelancers or freelance communities that you can start on the lower level. Now, caveat, you also have to make sure you have scoped your outcome. So if you come to a freelancer and they say, what do you do? And you say, I'm a designer. <laughs> cool. <laughs> like, all right, well, how, that, how does that help me? Are you good at WordPress? Are you good at uh, marketing, marketing print collateral? Are you good at Squarespace? Are you good at front-end development? 
that's going to be the driver from going from zero to 15 is even when the door is open, you have to have the scoped outcome. So is that helpful? Because I know that's the toughest part, right? No, is getting that's, that first you know, project. That, and don't compete on cost. That's the one thing I'll say. You know, you, you are completely right. At uh, one time, I just decided that I was going to become a website designer. And I took some free classes in YouTube. And then I approached a few friends on to LinkedIn. And I said, hey, you know, can I help you with this? And sure enough, one or two gave me an opportunity. Now I had a portfolio. Now I had something to show to other people. And it just built up. It just happened that after I did it for, for a couple of months, I discovered that that was not what I wanted to do. But it, it was just as simple as that. Free education through YouTube getting in contact with people, which is what you said, having a network. I had a network of, uh, of friends already. I just knock on some doors. Someone say yes. Now I had a proof of concept that I could bring to somebody else. And if I wanted to, by now I would have so much work, I wouldn't be able to handle it because I just saw that it worked. But the difficult part actually uh, is just taking the decision, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, and just letting go of the idea that it's going to be a secure paycheck at the end of the month. But if you let go of that idea, there's going to be way more than a secure paycheck. There's going to be people competing to give you their, their, <laughs> their uh, yeah. So that's exactly how you said it. And uh, I, I know it works. It's just, there has to be the right match between what you want to do and what the market is, is looking for. And I think one thing I'd add to you, Alan, is, is uh, don't underestimate the power of proximity. And so mm -hmm. I think a lot of times we assume that, oh, this was the perfect person who got that job. And that's usually never the case, right? It's usually related to some sort of situation that there's proximity. And one of the examples that I use is, is I grew up in a small town outside of Boston. I didn't know about computer science. I didn't know about the power of computers, you name it. And when I went to San Francisco, I met people who had grown up around that area and they just knew about it. And so they had different connections simply because they were within that proximity. I mean, this isn't necessarily just freelancer advice, but it's kind of general advice is if you want to, you know, get that first job or even get that fifth job, dive into the power of proximity, be close to your users. And that doesn't just mean go move to where they are. Maybe that means go join communities, go to the events that they're talking about. I mean, one example for me is last night I found a hashtag by going to an event that hashtag then unlocked 10 people that I should connect with here in Miami. Be crafty, right? right. Be, be scrappy and, and dive into the power of proximity, whether you're a freelancer, entrepreneur, you name it. Wow. Okay, Matthew, the last question is, can you tell us one more time the name of your book and where can people find, I found several domain names. So tell us, give us all the, all the information. Yeah. So the human cloud, so search the human cloud book. Uh, you could also go to humancloudbook.com. If you search Amazon, it should be the first thing that pops up. Uh, in terms of venture L it's venture L.io. Now, don't worry if you're wondering where all these links are, just, reach out to me on LinkedIn and you'll find everything there. Okay. And all the links will be in the show notes of this podcast. Matthew, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me on. This is great.